Thank you. We'll call the meeting to order. Everybody. Uh, join me with us. Uh, uh, who is the flag? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And welcome to the regular board meeting in the Valley Irrigation District, January 26, 2022. Madam Secretary, call the roll, please. Yes, Division 1. Here. Division 2. Here. Division 3. Here. Division 4. Here. Division 5. Here. Okay, and at the outset, we're going to be pulling item number 8 from the agenda this morning to bring, uh, to bring it back. Uh, it will be brought back on the February 9th board meeting. Okay, so strike number eight. And if we don't want it to be pulled? Yeah, why, why uh, is it being pulled? Because we have a lot of people showing up. Yeah. To so, it. my recommendation at this point is that it gets pulled to allow the board some additional time to ask additional questions. Mm -hmm. um, I don't feel that it's prudent at this point to go to a vote. No, I don't, I don't agree with that to go vote. Right. But I think that it's uh, just. We need to hear the issues from the people who I have put a lot of time in, who are showing up today to present and taking time off work, just to hear it. But they can now make comments as part of the. It's not on. It's not on the agenda. So now they can make their comments right now, right as soon as Chris allows that. To make the comments. Can we? Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. yeah. Oh, we, we, can't, can't, we can't respond. Yeah, we won't. Well, yeah, well then that's fine with me. But as long as they can. Oh, I'll try. And, and to be clear, this will be a full agenda item on February yeah. 8th or 9th. 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 As, long as, as long as they should, they've taken the time to be here. Right. Mm -hmm. I agree. Present. I agree. That's appropriate. I completely agree. Okay. So do we want to do that separate from... from no, it'll no. just be on public it'll comment on non-agenda items now that the item's been pulled. Yeah, okay. All right, so folks, if you heard that, if you want to comment this morning on the uh, water supply assessment for Idaho, Maryland, mine, you can do so during the public comment, which starts now for items that are not on the agenda. And any other items that you'd like to talk about that are pertinent to ID, now's the time to bring them up. So, um, Risa Heck, Huck, I probably butchered your name. Go ahead. Yes, it's Risa Huck. That's short for Teresa Huck. Um, I just wanted to ask, yes, I just wanted to ask that um, this NID board, please consider the concept that we already have a lot of contamination in Nevada County in our water supply. I myself have mercury poisoning from living at Lost Lake and Ubet Road. And Nevada County made a mistake and failed to knock on my door and tell me that I was living on a Superfund site. That's already been acknowledged by both the San Francisco Office of the EPA and by Nevada County Environmental Health. So what I am asking is that the NID board consider the fact that if we already have those kinds of problems, this is not a can of worms we can open up in our water supply. That's my comment. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, next, uh, Barbara R. Go ahead. Hi, good morning. Thank you. A uh, couple of questions for you. I am wondering, one, what is the best way to submit comment to uh, NID if we want to send an email or some other way? And two, where are the NID materials that would help me understand as a home, as a property owner of 40 plus years in Nevada, in the mine area, um, help me understand how everything intersects with the level of the water table, the water quality, and obviously what the drought has done to the trees and the great um, likelihood that more trees will snap and fall the more we drain the water and so forth. So what's the NID like 101, you know, one pager thing that would tell me how to think about that as a member of the community and a property owner. So one is how do I submit comments to you in the best way? And two is 
where do I get the most simplest information that tells me what to expect with the way the policies are developed? Uh, Chris, is the public email, is the administration at, uh, at nidwater.com? Is the administration though? I'm gonna double check. Yeah, so we, we can accept comments um, via email, via regular mail. And the email address And this is yeah. related to info you could also email me directly. It's Hanson, H A N S O N J, at nidwater.com. And we'll be happy to route your comments for you. Um, regarding the question related to any project specific impacts um, that would be associated with the mine, I do recommend that you visit the county's website and all of the environmental documentation regarding the project and all the associated studies are included on that website. So the county is the lead agency on the website. Um, NID does not hold those documents. Okay. okay, and just as a larger framework, um, you don't have something that says, this is how we look at water supply, water, you know, distribute, here's how we look at our jobs and our philosophy for um, what water looks like in Nevada County, how it intersects with the trees and the drought and the fire risk and all that and the water quality. Is there some primer on NID that I can get my hands on? Yeah, so how about we have this conversation offline? There's a ton of different um, documents that you can go to. So if you'll go ahead and email me, I'll send you some links that might you might find helpful. Thank you. Barbara, the next uh, uh, Calhoun Grant. Well, there he goes. Hi there. Okay. Hi, everyone. Your name, right? You did, it's Callum actually, like Calamari. Oh, okay. <laughs> hi, uh, I wanted to say hi to all the fellow concerned residents and the board members. My name is Callum Grant, and my partner Carrie and I are new residents of Penn Valley. Uh, we're frankly quite alarmed about the proposed project and its potential impact on the quality of life, the well being, and most importantly, the water in the county. Um, Frankly, we're skeptical about the assessment about that, that just 30 wells would be impacted by the project. That fig figure seems extremely low based on the impact of previous projects that were much smaller scale. It feels like this is gonna have a much more wide ranging impact than that, potentially hundreds of wells. And the massive amount of water this mine proposes to use could have impacts on wells throughout the area. But the accuracy of that assessment aside, what really concerns me is the solution to supply the owners of these 30 or however many wells it's gonna be uh, with NID water. Um, a little about us, as I said, we're new residents of the area. We live on three acres in Canyon Creek in Penn Valley. Uh, we're one of only two parcels in the entire neighborhood that for some reason don't have NID water. All our neighbors around us do. Uh, we currently rely on a well with 1.3 gallons a minute to irrigate our organic garden, our property. We use the water very responsibly. There's drip irrigation to reduce waste. But even so, this summer, we're going to be watering in very small stages to give the tank time to replenish. The previous owners have tried to get NID water and were cited numerous reasons why it wasn't possible, the drought among them. We're on the north side of the ridge here at the very end of the road, and there was a fire before there was a neighborhood that came here that came right up to the edge of what's now our property line. We're going to be relying on that with those 1.3 gallons a minute to grow our food and to keep our land from turning into tinder and to defend the property from a fire if, God forbid, one should come this way. And it's difficult for me to see the fairness or the sense of NID providing water to 30 homes with currently functioning wells while households like ours are still waiting to get connected. We need the water to defend our homes. We need the water to defend our neighborhood. And especially 
it doesn't make sense to do this, not in the service of a greater public good, but in service of a massively destructive commercial venture that proposes to drain even more water out of the community. I mean, we could forget about gold. We, the most precious resource in Nevada County is water. And we're proposing not just taking water from the residents who are here today, but for the next four generations of residents. Think about how precious water is today. Think about what that, how precious water is gonna be in 20, 30, 40, or 70 years. And um, that's my comment. I just, in the, in the interests of fairness and the interests of protecting future generations as well, I, I would urge you to not approve uh, this assessment. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Gray. Luke Walker, you're next. Go ahead. Yeah, good morning, ladies and gentlemen of the board. Thank you for allowing me uh, this opportunity to speak. I too live in District 5 in Penn Valley, and I too am waiting on approval um, to receive irrigation water from the NID. Uh, my neighbors and myself, I, I know of at least three other parcels who have been waiting uh, over five years to receive rights uh, for water from the NID. And it is also alarming to me as well to hear that uh, there's potentially enough water to provide uh, at least 30 residential wells um, in the event that they become contaminated when for the past five years, there hasn't been any for uh, just three uh, parcels out here in District 5. Uh, I'm also a firefighter and I hear uh, Callum's concern over his inability to protect his property with the available water. And, uh, you know, out here in Penn Valley, uh, conditions are dry. And any water uh, that, that will be out here would be sincerely appreciated. You know, I'm doing everything I can on my property and, and offering insights into my neighbors to uh, try and get defensible space and uh, a large part of that comes from having enough water to uh, plant uh, trees and shrubs that are resilient to fire and do well in drought conditions. Uh, however, they do still require water. And uh, finally, I would just like to ask, um, request, and, and also provide my expectation, you know, that when considering this water supply assessment, the board really uh, brings it back to the mission statement of providing a dependable quality water supply continuing to be good stewards of the watersheds, uh, all while conserving the available resources in our care. And, you know, uh, just as an outsider looking in, I, I struggle to see where granting uh, the project for the mine meets any of those three uh, goals outlined in your mission statement. Uh, that is all, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Walker. Uh, Julian Blanchard, you're next. Good morning, Mr. President, Ms. Vice President, and directors. Thank you for, uh, I'm grateful for the opportunity to speak today. My name is Jillian Blanchard. I own a home in Grass Valley, and I'm also a land use and natural resources attorney who used to work for the San Francisco Public Utilities Commission managing the Hetch Hetchy water supply system. So I know how tough your job is, and I really appreciate all that you're doing. Um, I wanna also thank you very much for pulling the item from the agenda. This is such an important water supply assessment particularly for a project that's gonna last 80 years and is currently based on an urban water management plan that lasts only 20 years in terms of forecasting. So with climate change and drought, um, I urge you to take a very close look at that and, and the underlying assumptions in the hydrology report that's been released in the draft EIR and really take a close look because NID and NID users will be left holding the bag if that assumption and that conclusion of 31 wells is a gross underestimate, which we, we believe that it is based on a number of previous studies. So I thank you for taking the extra time and I hope that you ask these careful questions before, um, before you approve it because it will enable the county to rely on NID's conclusions to approve this project. So it's a really important approval. Uh, the other questions that I would hope you ask is to make sure that the infrastructure needs that are identified in the in connecting these new wells uh, are affordable and constructible. Whether the assessment accounts for infrastructure to connect side streets, uh, is the amount, you know, what would happen if Rise Gold fails to pay for this infrastructure or the amount identified, which is more likely would be insufficient. 
then NID and NID users would be left holding the bag. So these are important questions we're hoping you ask. We also would request as a responsible agency under CEQA that you take a close look at the draft EIR and comment on it. Um, we rely on you and your expertise on water supply and water quality, and we're looking forward to your comments. And then the last thing I would say is uh, we do understand uh, that NID is required under the water code to respond to the request within a 90 day period, but we would also ask that you take the maximum amount of time that you need to, to research the issue and also request a 30 day extension, which is allowed under the code to give yourself as much time as you need before you make this important decision. So again, thank you so much for pulling it. Thank you for your consideration and for all that you do. Uh, Laura, you're next. Laura, you have your hand raised. You're next. I have to promote her. Okay. <clears throat> so you're the one. That's the <laughs> sorry. Hi. Hi, I'm sorry. I was trying to unmute myself. Um, uh, my name's Laura Galeasso, and I own property in Grass Valley. I'm actually one of the 30 some odd well owners that are directly impacted by this project. So my comment slash questions to all of you to consider there's not been one word to any of the 31 homeowners about is this something they would actually want or agree to to pay somebody else to bring the water to the house and and that's fine but who's going to pay the water bill after that the well owners all all well owners pay their water up front in the cost of drilling and getting the well put together and hooked up to the house. We pay for our water ahead of time at a considerable cost up front. So my question comment would be, will the well owners be reimbursed for that cost that we already put out? Will my future water bills be paid for by the mine owner after they have taken my water? without my permission, without asking me. I don't give them permission to take my water. Um, I thank you for considering this. I thank you very much for pulling this item today and further considering it. This is not going to just affect the 31 well owners that Rise um, Gold thinks it's gonna impact, it's not. So anyway, thank you, those are my comments. Thank you, Laura. Uh, Bill Lawrence, you're next. There, thank you. Um, thank you so much for bringing this uh, on your agenda. And I have more of a general question, and that is uh, Rice Gold proposes to um, basically send a large volume of treated water into South Wolf Creek. And my question is, is there any way that NID could partner with Rise Gold and use that water in a more efficient manner than dumping it into one of our waterways? And my question would be, has there been any discussions with Rise Gold on this type of partnership? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lawrence. Uh, Marion Blair, you're next. Hi, my name is Marion Blair and I'm a recent uh, resident. I bought property here uh, nine years ago with the intent to retire, which I just did. You know, I worked my whole life to be able to um, buy a home and settle where I really wanted to live. I love this community. And I used to work at a large water agency in the Santa Clara Valley. I was in the field a lot. I watched, um, you know, as reservoirs drained during the drought and, and we had to juggle things to, uh, to make, you know, to keep the streams flowing. And there were, it was a three pronged approach. I mean, there was flood protection, there was habitat enhancement, and then there's water to provide water for a, a population of several million people for the water treatment facilities and, and such. Mm -hmm. I have um, 
serious concerns. I haven't done my homework yet about uh, the source of water for the NID, although I know that some of it comes from the Yuba River. Whatever the source is, and I will do that. Um, as I said, I just recently moved. I, um, it's water is limited. And, and this is really obvious, um, you know, globally it is limited. It's a, it's a closed system, the hydraulic system. So I'm really concerned about uh, how this is gonna affect everybody's water supply. We, we have been in cyclical droughts for decades now. Uh, some of that was normal pre-industrial uh, times. However, it, it's getting worse. It's clear that climate change is, is in full force. We, we really need to question the prudence of uh, following up on this project. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Anyone else like to comment at this time, either uh, for items not on the agenda, including the uh, one we've been talking about, the water supply assessment 500 or more. Uh, Dallin, you're next. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, sir, go ahead. Thank you. Appreciate uh, you guys holding this and offering uh, opportunity for comment. Um, obviously, there's been a lot of good comments made to concerns around our water, uh, the availability of water here in Nevada County, and uh, what possibly this project that Rise Gold is proposing could do um, to availability of water and also the quality of the water, I think, are the two major concerns. And I'm, I'm really glad that, again, you guys have taken this off. You're giving more considered thought uh, to, to what is being proposed because I think there's considerable um, consider considerable uh, reality and reason to believe that what is going to be done will, will really reduce the availability of water because of what they will use, what they will siphon off from the community. Um, I mean, just this last summer, you know, I know there was cries of drought, and to be frank, regardless of what uh, is reality, you know, anyone who used the reservoirs this year knows how low they were. Um, you know, and we, we had had previously a good winter of water and I don't know how much rise gold is, um, is needing for their project, uh, in, in, in taking from, from our available water supply. But when we've had three good years of snowpack, uh, our reservoirs full and one year we see, uh, the droppage of our reservoirs like we did last year, it's really concerning that, a, that a big industrial, uh, group coming in and doing, uh, something like just mining gold. It's not something that produces anything good for our community, except for maybe a few jobs, uh, how that, that could affect our water supply. Uh, and then contamination, I think uh, with, with how far reaching the mine is already and, and how, the, you know, how much water is stored in there. Uh, I'm really concerned about water contamination. I'm also a well owner. Um, and I think anyone who has a well, what that will do to contamination as well as the water table my well might not be contaminated being as far away as I am, but uh, I'm really worried because I'm higher than that. I'm worried what it will do to my well, um, you know, as, as the water table lowers. So um, I, I believe before, you know, big companies like this have, have made waste of other communities. We need to be real careful. We've got an amazing community and it's not worth a trade-off uh, that, that Rise Gold is promising in my opinion, if there's, if there's bigger concerns. So appreciate you guys looking into this further. Dallin, anybody else like to comment? Like to comment? There we go. Um, William Packard, go ahead. Uh, uh, did you just say Dallin Packard again? I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm finished. I yield. I see William Packard. Is it the same one? No, he needs to hit the star uh, six to unmute. Uh, William, you need a star six your phone. There you go. Go ahead, sir. He's unmuted. Packard, are you there? I don't hear Mr. Packard. Nope. He's unmuted. He's unmuted. I went away. Oh, there he is. Okay. Mr. Packard, can you hear us? Go ahead. Okay, I apologize. This is Dallin again. I just made a comment. I'm really confused. I hear Mr. Packard. Uh, maybe there's another Packard on this Zoom, but I just gave comment if you're talking about Dallin Packard. You also William Packard. Okay, we'll move 
why. Anybody else like to comment this time? Start on your phone. Any item not on the agenda? He just came, it just came back. Okay, Mr. Packard. William Packard, go ahead. Star six, your phone to talk. Start late. He's got his hand raised. Yeah. Not, he's not star six. There he goes. Okay, try again. Go ahead, sir. Obviously, we're not making a connection. Something. Muted on his computer. <clears throat> Mr. Pa uh, William Packard, are you muted on your computer? There will be opportunity to discuss this again. Okay. <laughs> yes. All right. Since we have a technical difficulty, there we'll move on. If there's nobody else would like to, anybody else like to comment? Any item not on today's agenda? Start on your phone. Okay, we will move on. There's one more. Oh, there's another one. Uh, Jonathan Keen, go ahead. Yeah, can you hear me? Sure, go ahead. Oh, thank you. Yes. Uh, yeah. Uh, this is uh, my name's Jonathan Keen. I'm uh, I'm a uh, uh, residential customer of NID in District Five near downtown Grass Valley. I'm also the president of the Wolf Creek Community Alliance. And uh, thank you guys for I think you're making a good decision to hold off to your more formal discussions on this subject. Um, I agree with a lot of the uh, comments that have already come in. Um, uh, I think um, this is a big uh, project that you guys have a very important voice in. And um, so I'm glad that you are taking it uh, seriously. Um, the, you know, the, um, you, there are many areas in the draft EIR that uh, should be addressed by NID. Um, and um, uh, so I, uh, you, you're going to have to Somebody's going to have to study it carefully. It's like a thousand pages, and that doesn't include the appendices. Um, the so uh, one thing you might do right off the bat is request a 30-day extension to the DEIR, uh, which would be uh, would help everybody uh, if you can um, throw your weight behind that uh, request to the uh, county. Um, the yeah the subjects of are have all been brought up. Uh, the 30 wells that you are being asked to provide. Uh, it's an interesting idea, but the details are very lacking. Um, the, one of the customers who's being impacted, Brett raised the point of what about the investment that the pr private well owners have already made? Is that gonna be uh, reimbursed before they uh, um, hook them up to NID? Who's gonna pay the NID bills? Uh, in the future for the next 80 years. Um, anyway, I'll, uh, I'll leave it here. And thank you very much again for your attention to this important project that's coming up in our county. Thank you, Mr. Keen. Anybody else like to comment at this time? Start on your phone. Last chance to comment items on items not on today's agenda. Turn on your phone. Okay. The none, we will move on. Thank you all for your comments this morning. Uh, time certain at 9.05. Uh, it's 9.30, so we're not quite making it. <laughs> Redistrict that update. Oh, no problem. Uh, thank you so much, President Beerwagon. So today we have a presentation as part of the redistricting process. As the board is aware, 
um, essentially every 10 years when the new census comes out, it is necessary to go through a redistricting process which takes into account the new census information, um, essentially to ensure that the voting populations within the district are split um, fairly evenly within the requirements is also to not disenfranchise any particular group of voters. So before us um, this after or this morning, we have uh, Mr. Mitchell. He is from Redistricting Partners, and he is here to discuss the preliminary draft maps. There were three that were included in your packet, as well as a proposed timeline to get us to completion of where the board will select a map, um, and he'll review that timeline. But essentially, this needs to be in place for the 2022 election in November. So, Mr. Mitchell, could you please go ahead? Sure, thank you very much, and thanks for having me. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share a PowerPoint here just to kind of go through all of this, and then we're, I'll be available to answer any questions or we can talk about uh, changes or things that you want to see. Um, I want to emphasize these are not kind of like take it or leave it maps. These are part of a process of uh, showing you some things that we've been able to draw based on the data um, and you know trying to meet all the redistricting uh, criteria. Uh, but there is opportunity to make changes. Now, redistricting is a process that uh, agencies are required to undergo every 10 years. Um, I'm not sure if you did this in 2010 or not, but uh, in 2011, um, but it is something that uh, all special districts, school districts, county soups, you know, city councils, anything that has districted elections have to undergo every 10 years. The process, is, has become very politicized. There's been a lot of laws that have changed, both uh, you know interpretations by the Supreme Court, uh, pending interpretations maybe by the state Supreme Court on some California specific laws, and then uh, a lot of legislation having to do with uh, you know kind of every level of redistricting. Um, the the rules for redistricting for special districts are not as prescribed as they are for uh, cities and counties. Cities and counties have a thing called the Fair Maps Act, and that sets out a rank criteria for how maps are supposed to be drawn. Um, special districts don't have that. Now, the California Voting Rights Act does have some language about uh, drawing of districts, but that, again, isn't as prescriptive as the State Fair Maps Act. One of the things, though, is that redistricting in terms of policy around redistricting is very norms based and it's very and and you would be like in a, the best situation possible to try to follow the rules that are being applied by the state to other municipalities, unless there's a rational basis for not following those kind of higher standards. So, um, you know, the city council or county supervisor redistricting might have certain criteria that don't make sense. Like uh, in city redistricting, you're required to reduce the divisions of neighborhoods. That might not be the important thing in a water district redistricting, um, but there are other elements of the process that we can use from that. And these are some of the traditional criteria that are reinforced by state law. The first one is one that you are actually legally required to do, and that is make districts that are relatively equal size. Now, in the context of like a congressional district, you might recall, those are generally drawn to a one person deviation, meaning that the largest congressional district and the smallest congressional district only differ by one person. In California, that's 760,066 people, you know, on the dot. Um, for local redistricting, there's a much bigger buffer for what is considered relatively equal size or substantively equal. And that is a 10% buffer. Um, it means that if you had a district that had to be 100 people, you could have one district that was 105 people or one district that was 95 people. The difference between those two districts is 10 people. 10 is 10% of 100. And so having districts that were one at 95, one at 105 would be fine. It also means that you could have one district at 92 uh, and every other district at 102. And that difference is still 10%. It's negative eight to plus two. And so you could theoretically have your districts be uh, within that 10% range, but it doesn't always mean up five, down 5%. Districts need to be contiguous, meaning they need to be whole parts. Now, it is important to note that there are parts of some agencies that might have 
disconnected pieces in of themselves. Um, they're all our counties in the state are completely whole, except for some actual islands like Catalina Island or Treasure Island. Uh, a lot of cities have pockets outside of the in the unincorporated areas that they absorb. And then a lot of special districts might have, you know, an area that's disconnected. And in that sense, you can have non-contiguous parts be in a district, but we can't say, well, we're going to start a district down in Lincoln, and then we're going to like have it reappear up in Nevada City. It has to be a whole piece. Uh, we want to maintain communities of interest. Now, a community of interest is kind of an abstract term, uh, and it means different things for different agencies. I mentioned neighborhoods. Uh, where I live in my neighborhood might be a community of interest for a city council redistricting, but it might not be as important in a school district redistricting because maybe in a school district redistricting, it's more about the educational needs of my kid or the transportation needs of my kid or or what schools we have access to or what programs we have. So um, communities of interest are different things for different agencies. And in your case, your communities of interest might be people who have shared water needs. It might be people who have shared rates or concerns about access or um, the different issues you might have in an urban area and the services you provide in an urban area versus the services you provide in a more rural or open area. Um, following existing governmental lines is definitely a, a good um, way to justify the drawing of boundaries. I said earlier that cities can be, you know, weird shapes and you can have district lines and you will have district lines that have weird shapes in them, weird kinks and bends and, and different lines. And sometimes that's just a function of the census geography, like we have to follow the census geography in redistricting. Um, but sometimes it's also the boundary of a city. And so... When somebody says, well, where'd you get that strange line in that redistricting plan? Uh, you know, is that a gerrymander? You can say, well, no, it's actually, look, you can actually see it's the boundary of a city. Um, and so utilizing those as, as uh, ways to draw lines is kind of a best practice and it's within keeping of the state law. Keeping districts compact is not meaning small. You're not gonna necessarily have the smallest districts in your uh, redistricting plan, but it's the idea of compactness in California is defined as keeping nearby populations together, not drawing a district where you have a population and you bypass a bunch of nearby populations to go get some far away population. That's literally the definition that districts aren't compact if they pair uh, populations with uh, far away populations bypassing nearby populations. Um, when we look at your current districts um, or divisions, you can see that you have these uh, these five divisions kind of in a, what we would consider somewhat of a stacked um, uh, nature. It's not like that they're drawn in like a striped or columnar nature. They're kind of one on top of each other. And um, when we looked at these districts and had to consider how to draw new potential boundaries, the, we really look at the data. Um, the data allows us to see at first blush where we're going to have issues. In this data table, I've got two sets of data. I know you guys work a lot with data, so hopefully this isn't as troublesome as it might be with school boards and so on. But uh, uh, the top data set is a point in time survey. So it is how many people were where on uh, April 1st, 2020. It is... Uh, treated as the definitive source of how much population is in each city or uh, within each district. Think of that as kind of like somebody went out today and measured the snow, period. What was the snow on this one day at this one testing, You know, not any kind of averaging, just a one point in time survey. That second data set at the bottom is uh, from the American Community Survey, a totally different product of the US Census Bureau. And that product is a uh, average data set for data over the past five years, surveying three and a half million households in the US or three and a half percent of households in the US uh, every year. So think of that as your, you know, average of, you know, testing three and a half percent of sites that you might measure snow in and then coming back with the average. And this is one of the challenges sometimes. You'll have somebody say, well, you know, the snowpack was at this level and somebody else say, well, over the average of the last five years and looking at, you know, all these different sites, the snowpack was this level. You now have two different measures of the snowpack. 
but they are utilizing different methodologies. So we have to understand that these are two different data sets from the census, both with their own, uh, uh, both used for different reasons. That second data set is utilized uh, when we look at potential voting power in each of these districts. That total population of citizen voting age population should represent the eligible voters in each district. And the percentages for the ethnic populations there represent the percentage of those ethnic populations and how they could impact potential elections. You don't have any Voting Rights Act issues here. As you notice, all of these percentages in Latino, Asian, and African American are very small. In, um, in other parts of the state, you might find some of those numbers getting up to that 50% mark of one ethnicity in a particular district. And that's why this data is really here is, is for those agencies, Voting Rights Act issues um, have to be figured out in that second data set is the average data set. Um, your current population deviation among all your divisions. Your largest division is 22% overpopulated at 24,209 residents. Your smallest district is under 10%, is 10% underpopulated at 17,734 residents. So that gap of what's roughly, you know, 7,000 residents is a percentage deviation from your largest to your smallest of 32.7%. That's well outside that 10% buffer range that I was discussing earlier. Now, when we uh, let's look for a second real quick at where these are, Division 4 and Division 2. So Division 4 is the one that's overpopulated. Division 2 is the one that's underpopulated. And the overpopulated is much bigger of a concern. That overpopulation of 22% uh, means that that district is going to have to come down at least, uh, you know, maybe to uh, at most, maybe a 5% deviation for that individual district in order to kind of allow the full plan to become 10%. Uh, that means it's going to have to come down from 22 to 5 or less percent. Um, division two is going to have to come up from 10% underpopulated to maybe no more than 5% underpopulated or maybe even. So you can imagine the impact on that division four is much greater. And what's going to happen with this district? Uh, at the outset, just stepping back and thinking about this abstractly, if it is overpopulated by a fifth of a district, it has to shrink. And when we think about this district and where its population centers are, it's mostly in the south. So in the Lincoln area down here is where you have a large portion of that population. So as you think about this district, you're going to have to think about it. Most likely, if you were to do like a Re minimum change redistricting, you'd at least have to bring that division four district down, which is going to bring three down, which two needs to uh, grow a little bit. So maybe, you know, it kind of has this kind of pulling down effect. Um, and then within all the rest of the populations, there will be additional potential changes. Now, we created three plans. Think of A as our first best attempt and trying to draw the districts in a way that doesn't disrupt the entire architecture of your current districts. B is wipe the slate clean, try something completely different. And that was trying to unify some cities and draw something just very different. Um, and map C was a revision of A, but looking at different ways that those could be drawn to try to minimize the disruption of the existing districts. So, um, uh, I want to point out here that we um, are using the district numbers based on what we saw in the original redistricting plan, but especially when we get to plan B, the numbers could be whatever you want the numbers to be. Um, when you do finally adopt a plan, we'll make sure that the numbering is aligned to the numbers of your districts or whatever uh, uh, director is going to be running in which seat, if that's necessary to kind of align that. Because remember, numbers aren't just numbers. They also are aligned to election cycles. So uh, certain districts will be up in 22, certain districts will be up in 24. And we wouldn't want to do something that just kind of arbitrarily slap some new random number onto a district. So before we're done, we can make sure that any numbers align. But uh, this version of this plan does exactly what I mentioned at the outset. That District 4 is going to drop. And when that District 4 drops, how do the other districts adjust for that population change? And it attempts to do this in a way that minimizes that disruption. 
the deviation of this plan is only 1.3%. So that's a low, low, low percentage. It does allow you within this plan to maybe make some shifts uh, and stay within that 10% deviation range. You don't get gold stars for having a plan that's 1.3% versus 9.3%. It's just a, it's a binary test. Are you under 10% or not? Once you're under 10%, it doesn't matter, you know, how much closer you are to 0% deviation. When we look at this plan and the current districts, you can see this version of the map kind of attempts to show the overlay. The lines are the new districts, the shading is the current districts. And so you can see that the that division four, it was one fifth of a district over overpopulated, but it almost loses about a half of its geography um, because the denser population at the bottom. So that district is drawn in a way to try to pull that line down. When that line pulls down, three's line pulls down, but its northern boundary actually doesn't change as much. Um, its northern boundary is more stable in this plan. District two's footprint is very similar to its current footprint. It moves a little bit eastward, loses that westward tail that goes out to the edge of the bound edge of the district. District five is kind of in its same general shape with small adjustments here and there. And district one, same thing, same general shape but just small adjustments having to make sure that we meet that population equality. We also have an overlay with cities where you can see like where Lincoln is and you can see the different uh, cities in uh, the agency and where they overlap. Um, and we could make small adjustments if we needed to around that if necessary, but we tried where we could to try to follow some of these city boundaries here uh, to match those lines and make sure that they had a rational basis. Draft map B um, was another one using the, using it was basically starting from scratch. Um, and one of the things we were really trying to do in this plan was see if we could draw a district, let's say that took in Grass Valley and followed those district boundaries um, those city boundaries, and then kept together other jurisdictions along the way. Um, you can see this draft plan B here, very different construction. We just completely upended the idea of those stacked districts at the Southern end and made those into two columnar districts. Um, you might see this and say, aha, that actually does represent the community better and does better represent people in our agency that have different water needs and that are different communities of interest. Or you might say, that thing looks disgusting. Uh, we never want that. And that's fine. Uh, we're not trying to promote this as a, uh, you know, this isn't our work to try to get, um, you know, we're not gonna be trying to convince you of any particular plan, but we just wanted to show this as a, as a different option. This plan, 6% deviation. You can see some of the relationship to the existing lines in districts one, two, and five here. Now five and one switch numbers there, but we can switch that back. Um, what's really interesting is the city boundaries. So in this uh, map, we actually have Grass Valley entirely within district one. This right here, and you can see it here too. See, this is what we call an island. I, I don't know what you call it in, in your uh, discussions, but in redistricting, we call this an island. Those are areas of your agency that, that are within your agency that aren't covered by your agency. And Grass Valley kind of wraps around that island. So we drew district one to really try to encompass all of that. And then at the same time coming down here, um, you know, following the boundaries of Alta Sierra, following the boundaries of of other cities uh, as much as possible throughout the process to draw this line, these lines um, and create a very different construction. Now draft map C takes us back to the idea of A again. And um, having worked with a lot of agencies, you might see this and like this brings you back to a little bit more of a breath of fresh air again. Um, again, the relationship of the districts is much more similar. The relationship here wasn't to drop the floor of three down kind of evenly across, you know, east to west, but instead to drop the floor of three down more on the eastern side. Very small deviation. This is, I think, the most instructive map to look at in these. Um, one, again, very similar footprint to its current boundaries. Five, similar footprint. 
two, um, it's not going all the way east west, and it is taking in this Alta Sierra area. Three's floor definitely changes a lot on that eastern side, but doesn't change at all on this western side. So we keep the exact boundary on four on that western side. And we allow this pocket here is representative of that one fifth of the district's population that needs to move out of four and presumably into three. And then three has to move that population shift back up to two where it can kind of balance out. Um, the cities, again, you can see following the city boundaries as much as possible, Paul, where possible. Yeah. Tim, Paul, we have a quick question for you. Yeah. So, uh, Rich Johansson, so in, in redistricting, you didn't take into account where each of the directors lived. So it that is, a, yeah. So I will say in plan C, I believe all the directors are in their current districts. Um, but we didn't do that as a primary concern. We wanted to draw based on those kind of rank criteria. Um, and uh, we can always make adjustments and look at that, but it's, it's kind of a best practice to let the line drawing happen first and then start to introduce those questions. But I believe plan C does have all the directors based on the addresses that we have uh, being in their districts and plan A could be adjusted to allow that as well but i think the best i think plan c was basically adjusting a to try to address that concern so the question about plan b is that uh that was a dramatic so those numbers actually represent the divisions and why was vision three thrust all the way into lincoln <laughs> yeah i mean you know what's even... what's actually funny is what we usually do in this is we change it to letters when we make a plan that has this much change, oftentimes we'll just change these numbers to letters so that people don't get fixated on like, oh, you moved this district there. Because really, this was a blank slate map. We started from scratch when we drew this map and tried to look at when we were drawing it, we, we tried to look at how, in fact, when we the first thing we did was look at how to take Grass Valley and put it into to one district and see if that was possible. And then from there, let the rest of the plan kind of come together. Um, so the numbers are irrelevant. They could be apple, orange, pear, banana. They don't have any. You can change these numbers however you want, but you could. The, we did change the orientation of that three and four completely to columns um, in this construction, and then in C brought it back to kind of more the relationship that it currently is. Well, for future reference, uh, it did cause some confusion. Oh, I I understand, and it often does. I should have changed it to letters for that one plan. I know I would have gotten an email like, why does this plan have letters? But we get that too. We didn't know that. Well, any plan could be different yeah. numbers, right? So yeah. these are- Yeah, any of these plans, these are all, yeah, these numbers can change. In the 2019 plan, this is Director Peters, it was, it was yellow, purple, blue, teal, you know, it, it wasn't assigning. The numbers are irrelevant to the exercise. Yeah. Yeah, good point. We get to assign those at the end if we want. So we were just at the last slide and we can then close up this and then I'm happy to take more questions, but we um, are looking right now at just kind of these draft maps. We'll come back in February with revisions and then the idea would be to um, have a final plan selected and vote on that on in March. Uh, it's a best practice to anytime we're discussing maps, like when we discuss those map revisions or discuss the final maps, that we would have those uh, on your website and posted and available uh, a week before you actually vote. And I would discourage, you know, anything like, you know, having a meeting where the final meeting, somebody busts out with like, hey, I just, me and my brother just drew this perfect plan. We want to vote on something that's brand new that hasn't been on the website. It's a real principle in California municipal redistricting to make sure that any maps that are going to be considered are going to be posted on that website a week before you meet so the public has access. Um, and with that, I'll go ahead and stop that and happy to discuss. Thank you, Mr. Mitchell. We have a question from Director Hicks. Good morning. Let's see, a couple questions. Um, in, in the timeline, is there a requirement or a for public process. I'm familiar with what, what the Board of Supervisors did and they had public process happening for um, 
you know, took public comment and public input on these. Now, are we required to do that, and or should we do that? Yeah, so um, under the California Voting Rights Act, you're required to have a certain number of hearings, which is what you are doing and what you're accomplishing through this process. You're required to have that posting of maps seven days ahead of time. You're required to have it be done in open public hearings like this. Um, and under the Fair Maps Act that the county uses, there are additional requirements like they have to you know, communicate with outside organizations and try to encourage that in participation and and work with the media and and have a website that's up for 10 years with all the redistricting information. So there is a higher bar for counties and cities that are undergoing this under the Fair Maps Act. Under the California Voting Rights Act, we are required to have all these hearings be public and have all these maps be um, up on the website before you consider voting on them. So it's a slightly different level for special districts in general um special districts literally could have this done in one meeting um there isn't a lot of of uh you know rulemaking on that process so uh we're trying to follow the california voting rights act rules and the structure of this and then make sure that it gets done in a, in a manner that's consistent with that which we're meeting okay and my follow-up question is um, you've got March 2020 as a final vote on the maps, which I would imagine would be essentially adoption. Then would the maps at that point become um, what would be used for the upcoming 2022 elections? There's, I think, three of them, two of them, three of them that are, are going to be running in, uh, in November 2022. So which, which maps will, or which divisions would be operable? So that's a great question because it confuses a lot of people. You'll you'll adopt this map. It will be the districts for your agency for here for the next 10 years. However, um, you have to think about implementation of redistricting happening over a two year a two election cycle. You're going to have your board seats that are going to come up in 2022. They will become operative. Then the board seats that come up in 2024. And then those lines will be operative for that election. And in between 2022 and 2024 election cycles, you'll be kind of in a hybrid situation where you're going to have directors who were elected in the new redistricting plan and some other directors who are still representing the districts they were elected in based on the lines as they were in 2020. And so in that hybrid moment, you might have some situations where a district line moved and like you're representing an area, but somebody else was also represented by a portion of your voters in the new districting plan. And so there is this issue of it's called accelerations and deferrals. It's kind of a technical thing, but there is an issue of when you adjust lines, you're invariably going to have a situation where, you know, some people just elected somebody in 2020 and the lines move and now they get to elect somebody else to a different numbered district because that they now are in a different division and they're voting for somebody on the ballot in 2022 um, when they they're like, wait, I just voted for somebody in 2020. Why am I voting again? Um, and you'll have other people who, you know, voted in 2018 and they're all amped and ready to go vote for their next director uh, in 2022 and they get there and there's nobody on their ballot because the kind of lines moved out from underneath them. And for a two year period, they're not electing somebody to the board and their lines will become operative in 2024 and then they'll vote then. And so that shifting of district boundaries always creates these little edge cases of um, people who, uh, you know, are being accelerated or deferred in that process. And then lastly, do these, do any of your maps align with or yeah, align with the maps that have been recently adopted by the Board of Supervisors? So we, Division 1, Supervisor District 1, I mean, that's sort of how this could, yeah, sort of, sort of. There was sort of some overlap and it, and to some degree it made some sense. So. Curious about if you would comment on that. Yeah, so um, we haven't looked at counties. Um, we could definitely look at the county boundaries to see uh, where they align to your divisions. Um, the uh, uh, the issue sometimes there's a couple issues. One is you have five districts, um, and the two counties have five districts, so they're obviously not going to align. Um, the uh, the second thing is that oftentimes where a county boundary 
uh, is drawn might be based on something that has nothing to do with your agency, like where one of their supervisors lives. And so, you know, you say, okay, we're going to adopt this line that comes down in this weird dog leg and captures this other thing. And you find out in three years that the only reason they drew that line that way was to put an incumbent into their house or because in county redistricting, they're supposed to follow cities and census designated places that maybe there was some census designated place it needed to capture. So using other governmental agency lines as your lines can sometimes be a, a little bit of a, a way to make the lines make more sense to some people. Because they can say, well, I'm in Supervisor District 2, and I'm also in Nevada Irrigation District 5. And, and it's always been like that. Um, and so that's a rational basis, but it um, you know probably needs to be taken within context. And honestly, we didn't do the redistrictings in either Placer or Nevada counties, so I don't have the their new boundaries. But we could try to get those. The county won't have those new boundaries processed either because um, they're still in the midst of getting those files from the counties and you know, converting them to their uh, precinct. So um, we could look it up, but we haven't, we haven't done that. I don't know that it's important. Well, and so I just want to, for my clarity's sake, we have three directors here who will all be on the ballot in November. For those three directors, they will be running in whatever the new divisions are that yeah. we come up with. Is that correct? Yeah, they'll be running those new divisions and it's only the voters in those divisions that'll be voting for them. Um, and uh, that will be, and then the other two uh, will currently be representing the voters that elected them in 2020. And they'll continue to represent that footprint until they get reelected to the new boundaries in 2024. So Paul, it was, it's my understanding that if the boundaries change for the districts, and there is currently an incumbent in the geographical area of the district that a somebody who's up for election who's also in the same district could potentially not be able to run because that seat's not open. Yeah, so there are if every yeah, if every supervisor in the district yeah. If two supervisors are in the same if two directors are in the same district, let's say. And let's say they're both in the same district and uh, one was elected in 2020 and the other was elected in 2018. And you guys say, okay, we're gonna have this new district. We're gonna put it, number it so that it's up in 2022. Those directors would have a choice. The one who's terming out and be, their term ends in 2022, they might obviously say, well, I'm running in 2022. I always was, I was planning on, I'm gonna run in 2022. The other person whose actual term doesn't expire until 2024, they might say, well, okay, I'm going to run too. And they could run in 2022 for that new district, even though their old term hasn't expired. And if they win, they would have to vacate their old seat. You'd have to appoint somebody to that seat and so on. Um, that so, is one scenario. So if they're both located in the, the new district. That's what I was saying. If they're both, both located in the new no. The other option, just so that's one, one scenario with two people with different election cycles and you move the election to 22 and the one that's not, whose term doesn't expire until 24, they would have to run for it and could then vacate their old seat if they won. The other scenario is you say, okay, we've got two directors. One is up in 22 and the other one is up in 24. We're gonna number this district in a way that it will be up in 24. Well, at that point, the person who was elected in 2020 says, great, in 24, I'm going to run for that seat. And the person who's up in 2022 says, wait a second, I can't run for that seat in 2022 because it's no longer even, there's not even an election. If I want to uh, be on the board, I need to, my term will expire in 2022. I'll have to sit out and wait two years until the election comes up to run for that district in 2024. At that point, they could run for that position in 2024, but you know, they, they're basically the term is expiring and there's not an election up for their seat yet. Now, so um, need to clarify, Paul, just really quick, because there's a little bit of confusion here. The board is not only deciding on the new divisions, but can also use their discretion to decide on the election cycle for each one of those divisions. And just to make it a little crazy and extreme, they could say we're going to put all five up in 2022. No, they can't do that. You cannot do that. 
No. Um, all they can do is, so for my clarification, the three seats that are up in 2022, are they districts one, three, and five? No. No. One, two, what four. Are they? One, two, four. One, two, four. Okay. I like it when they're odd and even, but that's fine. So one, two, and four. Um, districts number one, two, and four are going to be up in 2022, no matter where you put them. So one, two, and four, the district numbers that are going to be up in 2022. And presumably you'll keep them in generally the same footprint that they're in right now. But if you changed one and you said that district three is now two and that district three, two is now three, it would change the election cycle of that, of those two geographic areas. Um, so you, you are still going to follow that same pattern. One, two, and four are going to be up in 22, three and five are going to be up in 24. Um, but you are, but in getting to number the districts, you are that an inherent part of that process is going to be aligning the election dates, but you aren't able to either a say, okay, we're just going to scrap it all and have our elections all in 2022. You'd have to have the voters passed a measure to allow that. And you also can't, as an example, say, well, Hey, I'm going to make this district number 20, uh, date 2022, you director who are up in 24, we're just going to truncate your term there. You can't use the districting to truncate anybody's term. They're elected their four years. You can't undo that. So for example, if a district has an incumbent that is not up until 2024, and there is another board member that is now within the same boundary as the incumbent up in 2024, they cannot run until 2024? Otherwise, you'd have two members in the same boundary. So if you have two members in the same boundary, and one is up in 22 and one is up in 24, you have a choice. Do we date it? number it so that it's up in 22 so they can battle it out or do we number it so that it's up in 24 so they can battle it out but after 22 when this person's term expires uh, they're gonna have to be out of office for two years before they actually battle it out so in either so instance they can still run against each other but it's just a matter of when that election comes up and you could have a situation where somebody who's up in 22 ends up having their term expire and they're looking around. There's like, there's, I can't run in anything right now. They have to wait until the election date happens in 24. You guys, I know it's confusing, but trust me, it's, you guys are a lot smarter than, than when we have to do this for some school boards and such where they're not usually mathy people. <laughs> Can we comment on the maps at all? Well, yeah, Absolutely. the purpose of today is to provide any input on the maps yeah. and also to provide direction if you'd like an additional map drawn. Okay. There we go. Well, and then, you know, Jennifer sent me, and maybe she sent all of us, the maps where you could um, zoom in so you yeah. could really see the, and, and I'd like for that to be up here when we're talking about our maps discussion. I can do that. Maybe. Yeah, we, yeah, it is. Yep. Let me get those for you, and I'll get those up while you're talking. And and maybe if somebody, if they want to, I'll bring all three of them up so that I can flip between any of those. It'll just take a second. One level above a school board. <laughs> I, always, I always thought school boards are pretty sharp. I hope I wasn't disparaging school boards. I love my school boards. I was just kind of making a joke. I have an overarching question. Yeah. As, as the way down is where the lines are drawn. Do they follow roadways, waterways, watersheds? What is the, how do you determine where that exact line? It's actually is? census blocks. So it's a census geography. And census geography is something that's kind of given to us. We're not able to really modify it. Uh, every 10 years, the Census Bureau goes through a process where they contact the counties and say, hey, counties, like, here's your census blocks. Why don't you give us some thoughtful input on to how we should use what lines we should use? And in a lot of states, they send in, here's our water district boundaries. Here's our school district boundaries. Here's our, you know, election districts. And they send in all this data to the U.S. Census Bureau and say, you know, use these lines as much as possible when you're drawing the districts. Only San Francisco County participates in that in California. Like the counties in California do not actively participate in that, um, at least not to the same extent they do, they do around the country. 
So we have a lot more problems in California with uh, census boundaries, not following things like a water district boundary or following things like a school district boundary, or even the cities of Davis, Napa, uh, just recently uh, had lines that the census was wrong on their external boundaries, um, just because the counties don't do a lot to participate in that. So it's a little bit of a problem. So I'm happy, this is draft plan C, this is B2, and this is A, and I should also be able to like type in an address and bring up an address as well um, on these web maps, or you can do that on your own. And this does show, you know, where these boundaries are all the way down to the street level. Well, I just some Comment. kind of comments. I, I think that um, your idea of including Grass Valley uh, within one division, such as one, is a really good idea. Um, I also think that um, on map C, a, another good change is Alta Sierra going 100 percent mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. Division Two. Um, <laughs> I, I like that map. Yeah, I, I had a question. There's a this little, like little sliver on the east side of Division Two that is part of Division Three, and I wondered what the kind of the logic of that was. This is C. See, okay. Yeah, there's a little uh, coral sliver uh, next to Division Two, on the on the eastern side. Oh, on the eastern a, side, that's weird. Of... Yeah, that is okay. So that issue uh, shows up on your overlay um, because the way the census blocks are shaped. There's a census block that starts all the way down here and courses all the way up here. And so it's just a matter of a geographic abnormality. And it's actually not in our District C plan itself, it's in your existing lines. Your existing districts based on their census blocks does have a non-contiguous part here. It's like right there. We also have so the same thing over here in division three in this bottom part. See this little portion of a census block, it likes there and it's there and it's here. That's a census block that gets split up by the jurisdictional boundaries of your agency. Um, so this census block is actually part of a census block way over here. Um, it's just this cutout of it from, uh, so that'll get cleaned up when we actually transfer it to the counties because the counties are gonna use parcel layers. But on slide, one of the slides in the PowerPoint, it's actually slide 24 of the PowerPoint, does show your existing boundaries actually Division three, technically based on the census geography comes up to here and has this disconnected part. But in this version, it doesn't. In map three, or C, plan yeah, This C. is map C right here. Okay. So you'll, you clean those things up because in ours, it shows it being part of division three and you're just saying it won't be. Yeah, I think what it's showing is you might be looking at the overlay layer, but maybe. Yeah, it's a technical. Oh, it would be a little tech. Oh, you're talking. Are you talking yeah. about? Yeah, you're talking about this red thing right here on that map, right? Correct. Correct. Yeah, that's the old districts. Okay, um, my other. It, it's more of a question, and possible consideration um, is. For the differences between Division Three and Four, wondering if it would make sense to include the Auburn area in Division Three and kind of link more of uh, Lincoln addresses with Division Four. Um, That's essentially anyway, what we did I, here, right? I mean, we could well, have, we could have yeah. swapped these numbers, but Lincoln and trying to get up to, if you take this the Auburn portion out of the Lincoln district, it really has to go taking a lot of area because it's losing a lot of population when you do that. Um, 
And so that is approximately what we were trying to do in this was link the Auburn area. And is this called North Auburn or something? Or I forget. Um, try to link that Auburn area to go north into North Auburn um, and then up into Meadow Vista on this eastern side. Now, of course, we're crossing the county boundary here. So it's not like what we're doing in this plan where we're following the county boundary a little bit in plan C. In plan B2, we're kind of ripping past the county boundary, but it's that challenge of trying to create districts that are equal population. Well, when you first, your first comments, you talked about the fact that the Lincoln population had been the growth area. And so, I mean, I'm, I, I'm not advocating for it. I just, it seems that part of what happened with the, the third map C is that um, the, the district drop, D division three drops into the Lincoln area and, and it's, it carves, it, it remains Auburn remains an outlier down in division four. Yeah. I'm not I'm not saying that that's right or wrong. I just pointed out that if you're looking at kind of uh, division three includes North Auburn right now, and there's this kind of weird jutting out where Auburn is within this division four that encompasses a large the largest part of the the city of Lincoln and rural Lincoln. So yeah. I just pointed out maybe for consideration of a potential modification, but really not advocating for it either. I don't, I mean, I'm, yeah. I, I don't really care. One of the much. things I that's interesting think, about, so in the, in a redistricting in an area like yours, where you have a, a handful of more densely populated areas and then some very unpopulated areas, right. when we take out, let's, let's call this like, you know, one inch of this purple out, it causes you to take up like 10 inches of this space up here to balance it. There's as many people in this sweeping whole area here of red as there is in this little area here of purple. And so when okay. you do take that out, it's just like, poof, it changes the whole architecture. Okay. Else, points, questions. I'm interested in what Laura has to say because I, yeah, yeah, you know, Lincoln is this anomaly too. You've got large ranching, farming properties, and then you've got dense population. And I'm wondering how this configuration impacts you and your constituency. How which, which one? Well, I mean, any of them. I mean, what does you know, what would be the... Well, the anomaly with the city of Lincoln is that if it, if it were a derivative, I knocked on all these doors in my last campaign. And I go, why in the world is an ID knocking on my door? Who are you? Yeah. The city provides our water. So I, I got to educate them and let them know that an ID provides wholesale water to PCWA, who treats it and sends it to the city, who does the distribution and, and billing. And, and they're going, that is the weirdest thing I've ever heard. So. This particular group of people, they're not really concerned in NID business. They're they're concerned in city business and their city residents. And and they have no our fingerprints are so diluted by the time it gets to their so it's hard to represent them. They're, well, and I'm thinking of the community of interest idea. You know, what how does that community of interest compare to say the more rural part or to the well, that community of interest is very interested in more transparency and understanding. You know, the, the more urban Well, that people, wasn't what I was saying so much they as, like, their issues, you know. Yeah, and they don't have any issues with NID because they take all their issues to the city. Okay. Huh. We sell them here from Lincoln residents. I sell them here. It's, it's the rural Lincoln so area. In all the city of Lincoln in the, in the no, no, very small portion. Very small portion. Very right, small not, portion. Okay, so it's, it's not all, but so right. it's not. It's a division. There's a division right. there. Yeah. It's not an area of interest that you can find in one spot. That's correct. Right. Okay. Yeah, and and they they have different they interests. Get water. They don't get their water from the They get from PCW. You treat it. That section that's represented by you. Yeah. 
That's right. That, that so you're whole, special. I know. It's a very special community. And it's a very diverse community. Yeah. It, it's, 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 right. you know, there, it's, it's, um, it's a changing, changing demographic and changing um, interest. Yes. So the, the issues of the district are, are more with the rural raw water mm -hmm. customers. Right, right. And and that's that's where I spend most of my time at the director. Right, sure. And that's probably who has the greater need for feeling as the representation right. for the representation. Right. 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 Um could you comment on what this big white hole is in the middle of, of division three? It's not the town of Auburn. No. What is it? But that's the community of Auburn close community area. Oh it is. Oh, interesting. I didn't hear that. Auburn Valley Country Club. Yeah. yeah. Hmm. Oh. Okay. Huh. But don't they get water? I hadn't tuned into that. They don't have a district. We they provide them water. District water. Because uh, you would have to ask Jeff that one. I don't know. Yeah. I no. I think uh, uh, this yeah. talked to Joe Fisher, and he took me down there, and they had to show these big ponds of water that runs down there. So somehow they get water. Anyway, that's. Are they uh, are they customers? Are they out of district customers? No, no, no. He does not. I, I don't know if they buy water, but that particular area is out of district. It's out of mm -hmm. the district because they talked about trying to mm -hmm. annex in to be able to get treated water because of wells and stuff. Okay. Anybody else? Yeah. Go ahead, Rich. So tag with me, Ricky. Here. Yes, I will. Okay. All right. So. Paul, I like what you did on uh, Plan B with five and one, that you're giving one more responsibility with Grass Valley and that urban area, mm -hmm. and then you're giving five a little more responsibility to the north, which is more rural. More rural and more farms and ranches and things. So we agree. I agree. It's more of a community of interest in my I head. Think, I, think it's a I don't know yeah. if, that's, if I'm accurate, but in my head, it seems like that's yeah. correct. So you got the two directors who represent five and one agreeing uh, that what you did on uh, Plan B works. And we could essentially transplant the footprint of five, one, and two from Plan C on top of something similar to the four and three construction from either A or C. So there is a possibility if you wanted to take this arrangement of one, five, and two and apply it here and then just have four and three be this kind of structure. Right, however it works out between other directors and other divisions. Yeah, so there is a possibility to take these and kind of, what is that what you do when you- like a walnut tree, you do that? <laughs> grafting. <laughs> Thank you, grafting. You can graft it. See, I know you guys are smart. I also like Plan B already for those two reasons. So it's up to you two gals. Plus the Altus here. I like it. Yeah, Altus I think here is not split. Right. 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 It much more sense right. to have. Yes, one, so have one cons director. You have consensus on one, on Plan B for one, two, and five. Yeah. Great. So, we're discussing taking direction if, you, if you'd like additional maps, then we'll come back again. Wait a second. Yeah. We're in. But we don't need. You guys have to weigh in. Three and four. On plan B? Is that what we're talking yeah, about? Well, let's, let's, yes. Well, plan B for the purposes of one, one two, two, and five, five yeah. and then how you, where you guys are at with so, three and four. Yeah. You know, and, and how the direction we would give them to redraw or modify in three and four. So the dramatic change between A and B for three and four. So yeah. we, we'd, we'd be redrawing a new map. Oh, yeah. So then you'd have four to choose from. So if you want to see a, a fourth iteration of a map, that's what we would do if you want to I change see. the bottom. Yeah. Okay. So you'd have A, B, C, and then D would be this one. Yeah, and the plan so D could be the top portion of plan B and the bottom portion of, and you could pick either A or C um, as your bottom, and then we could create that kind of a uh, hybrid map and bring that back as plan D for you. Yeah. So we just need to know which which three and four those those directors like more between A and C or B. I mean, if, then you're back to B though. 
<laughs> well, I would be inclined to go with um, Plan C for three and four. That's that's what I would suggest. But I mean, I'm so top of Plan B and bottom of Plan C mm -hmm. as a hybrid. Yep. Did you hear that, Paul? I think the fourth map. Well, let's yep. let Laura. She's not in her head. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's the only way I would be able to run in 2022. If we went with Plan A, I would be out of my division. Or B. Hmm? Or B. Or B. Right. Yeah. Or, 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 or B. we have to or B. I'm out well, of my yeah. You know, there would just be modifications so that that didn't happen. That, I think that's good direction for me. Um, I think that's all I need to hear to be able to come back with something that would be uh, maybe more useful and we can then tinker uh, with that if we need to at the next hearing. Yeah, because Division 4 has always historically represented rural Lincoln. Yeah, mm -hmm. I think that makes sense. Not really? Auburn. Right. Okay, uh, at this time we'll take a public comment. For, uh, anybody like to comment on the draft maps for redistricting? Star guy on your phone. Let's see. Uh, touch. No. Yes. Now what do I do? I never know what to do. You want to call up on Margaret? I think it stopped yeah. because I overrode it already. Did you see a call? Yeah. Margaret. Margaret, would you like to comment? Go ahead. Margaret, you'll have to unmute yourself. Yeah, I think I just did. Can you hear me? Yeah, you can. go ahead. Okay. I. Some of you may know I, I do some work with newsletters, and I was trying to follow Paul Mitchell's um, comments about what's going to happen in terms of the overlapping um, when districts, you know, and it was very confusing. I'm wondering, Paul, if you could write something up for us about that, um, that so we could tell people about, oh, yes, your district may disappear and, you know, what you were trying to to say could you do some is there a write-up you have or you could do that we could have i can send something into chris that explains accelerations and deferrals yeah yeah because uh i could see that could be <laughs> rather confusing thank you and we have a re we have a redistricting page on the uh on the home page of the district website there's a redistricting yeah we, we will load that information onto the website okay that'd be great thanks Anybody else like to comment on uh, redistricting draft maps this morning? Start on your phone. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Mitchell. Great Thank you very much. Oh, I'm sorry, I have one. She has one more. I, I, one other question came to me. Um, and um, so. Assuming we go forward and Grass Valley is put into Division One as we're sort of chatting about, and then go on down the road another year or two, and Grass Valley decides they want to annex, and suddenly there's this huge population that influxes into what would be Division One. Then what happens? <laughs> I'll jump in front of Paul here, but he can correct okay. me. Any time you do an annexation, whether it's one parcel or hundreds, uh -huh. you have as part of the annexation resolution on annexation, you designate which division the parcel would uh, go into. So there would, I suspect, need to be an analysis of does this large block get split up into, you know, equally into what are the divisions one, five, and two, mm -hmm. or is there, or is there some other logical way to do it. But you don't redistrict the whole district, correct, Paul? But it would be done at the time it was annexed, or it would be done at the time, because this is like, what is this, a 10-year plan or something? Yeah. Well, let me let Paul jump in here. Okay. I, you have to do it at the time of annexation. Oh, you do. But okay. you would also revisit it at, at the next census mm -hmm. data came out. Yeah, you definitely so would ahead. have to, re you would definitely, um, need to annex it and identify which division or divisions that population is going into 
Um, you would also have to do your redistricting in 2031, incorporating that new population into your uh, redistricting in 2031. It would be optional if you had, say, some big 20% increase in your entire division, you know, and all of a sudden these two districts are wildly out of equal population. It would be optional for you to do what's called a mid-decade redistricting. Um, uh, in the state law, it requires it for cities when they adopt, I think it's more than 20% of an area into their city that they uh, do a mid-decade redistricting. If they adopt less than that percentage, they're not allowed to, uh, I believe at the city level and the county level. Well, counties don't annex, but at the city level, they wouldn't be able to do a mid-decade redistricting. It for prohibits mid-decade redistrictings at the city level um, unless there's a massive annexation. But in most cases, you would be able to absorb that disperse it between two districts and then just wait until your next redistricting. Got it. Okay. Thank you for that. Okay. We have a, we have another call. Uh, caller, uh, Christy Barton, go ahead with your question. Comment? Start on your phone. Uh, no question. I'm, I'm just a lawyer. Did you hear that? Did you, did you have a comment? No, I'm I'm just an observer. Okay, well, your hand was raised like you wanted to talk. That's my my. Well, I'm trying to lower it. I'm trying to lower it, but I click on it and it still shows <laughs> that I have my hand up. Yeah. Yeah. Now you have your and, hand down. Thank you, sir. Oh, there went back up. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else like to comment? Director Johansson. Yeah, quick question for the Auburn Country Club. See Chip back in the room. Are they, yes. they were excluded out of district or division three? They're not part of the district? They're in an exclusionary island, correct. And their source of water? They do buy a limited amount from us based on RCO. Um, so they buy raw water, but they have their own treated water That's uh, what. supply. So they're an RCO. And they're That's served under RCO, yes. Gotcha. Gosh, there you go. Yeah. Okay. Anybody else? Uh, comment or question? Okay, thank you, Mr. Mitchell. We'll look forward to hearing back from you. Thank you. Very good. Yeah. I'd like to make a motion. I'll make a motion to accept the consent agenda. Okay. That's what we need. If the line is open, let's pull the item. I do have a second. Second. Is there any public comment on the consent agenda? Done. Secretary, you call the roll, please. Division four. Aye. Division one. Aye. Division five. Yes. Division three. Aye. Division two. Aye. All right. Remember the general manager's report. All right. Thank you, President Beerwagon. I just have a couple very, very brief items. Um, Chip, do you want to start out with a little update on water storage? Oh, I don't have the current numbers. We are updating them as we speak because we're doing a snow survey today. We're doing the snow dance. But I was oh, great. Yeah. yeah, so we'll report out when we hear the better, results of that. Better do it yeah. before it melts. <laughs> <laughs> I know, it's been a before little warm. Before it melts. What about Chip, any rain coming, do we know? They, no, right. they had some in the forecast and unfortunately took it out. So the next 10 day window is dry again. Dry, dry, dry. dry, dry. Yeah, the Red long term is looking dry as well. Okay. The, um, just a point of information, the recreation reservation system for campgrounds is up and going and we're selling out some dates very, very quickly. Um, so that's good news. People are wanting to get out and about. So if anybody wants their campground reservations, I suggest you do it now or you may miss out. 
We are also still in the process of coordinating with the U.S. Forest Service regarding the transition of the upper division campgrounds back to them. Um, they have, we've been kind of going back and forth on some pricing. Um, we're still kind of at a standstill. So we, I will continue to keep the board posted regarding that issue. And then the last item I had on my list was just related to the dry weather. Thank you, Jennifer. Yes, ma'am. Jennifer, could I ask a question? When will we be revisiting the drought, our approach for the drought uh, for 2022? That is coming at the first meeting of February. Thank oh. you. We are kind of waiting for the snowpack survey. Um, and then, you know, it's up to the board's discretion as to whether you would like to take any proposed action based off recommendation of staff. Uh, we're still going back and forth about what our recommendation is going to be. We were trying to wait for the snowpack survey to better formulate what we are going to be recommending to the board. Thank our you. drought policy, is that on the agenda to update our drought policy? Yeah, so currently we have a drought contingency plan and as the board um, will recall, it's kind of a little bit of a hybrid model. Um, it doesn't exactly match up with what was included in the urban water management plan as well as the agricultural water management plan. So we're in that hybrid stage of 2.5. We are going to make a recommendation regarding the actual stage within this hybrid plan, but we're not planning on bringing back at the first meeting of February a newly proposed drought contingency plan. We wanted to touch on some of that information um, during the plan for water process as well as start talking about it in the terms of the drought surcharge, which was part of the Prop 218 process. So we will not be bringing back a fully new, newly proposed drought contingency plan, but we will be bringing back a recommendation regarding the drought stage. So currently we're kind of in that, you know, two and at 2.5 drought stage of the contingency plan, mm -hmm. and that does include the drought surcharge. So for example, if the board were to authorize going to stage one, then that drought surcharge would be dropped. Mm -hmm. It seems like we should just update and say 2 points and adopt the drought plan because there's additional information in that drought plan besides just those stages. And specifically, what I'm concerned about is the, the raising of the minimum carryover, and, you know, and the, and the currently adopted plan at 78,000 acre feet carryover. Minimum. Now it's 110, but that's not documented anywhere. And and so and maybe somewhere in an aggregate plan, but our, our, if someone wanted to know what is the district's position on drought contingency planning, and they go to our 2015 drought contingency plan, it would not reflect what our true stage is and what we're doing. So it would seem to me that we would want to do a 2.5 and acknowledge this as a hybrid, this is a, a moving model, but this is, as of February 2022, this is, this is the adopted, board adopted drought contingency plan, and this is, this is um, staff did have a conversation about this as well um, in the past few days. I think our recommendation is that that be considered during the plan for water process because there are a lot of different methods in which to address those numbers or to set those numbers based off of the board's strategic priorities, uh, priorities for water use, the thought of the future risk of climate change. And so I think our recommendation will be to really tackle that more in depth going into the plan for water process. But at this next meeting, we are not planning on bringing back a newly proposed drought contingency plan. Right. So when you look at the numbers, uh, last year we got, and the whole state of California got the fact that, okay, we have so much in the reservoirs and we're anticipating a runoff, which never came. And so we'll get both numbers, anticipated number and what we have current in storage, because right now we're it doesn't look good. Right. I think um, uh, part of the issue is needing to do some updated modeling on climate change to understand the state of runoff and how it's being impacted by climate change, which we're not quite. We don't have that information at our right. fingertips yet. It's not easy. No. Can I ask just a general question? Do most districts have a drought contingency plan that uh, kind of drives the decision making of the board? Or is it more organic in that you're looking at your con conditions year to year and then developing the plan for that year? Because I, I mean, I, I get what Laura's saying. 
have a quote plan, but we really don't aren't fitting into that plan. But at the same time, I realized why we did what we did was because we wanted a more organic mm-hmm. approach. And it seems to me that as as our conditions remain so fluid and unpredictable in many ways, that a quote plan that you are, you know, almost implying it's a policy yes. that doesn't really align is a. Um, I don't know that that's where we want to be as a district, and and that. It seems that the organic approach is the approach we'll be taking, and that that plan potentially will always be, you know. And I and I don't think I want to know if if there's a purpose for it and what other districts are doing. Yeah, so it's actually a requirement of the urban water management plan. I think it's also of the agricultural management plan. So it's one of the things that's challenging is you know, from some practical perspective, both of those plans are what you know staff and people in the business will refer to as regulatory documents that don't have a whole lot of practical use in the year, the five-year period in which they're supposed to be active and implemented. Um, and so that's kind of how we got to the place that we're at. I do think that although you need to have some flexibility in the implementation of the plan, specifically because we're in this crossroads of climate change right now where we don't fully understand it, um, I do think that it is necessary to have something that is able for a drought and conservation perspective that you can implement off the shelf to allow your constituency to understand your water planning mechanisms for when water supply is decreased. I think where our drought contingency plan is still causing heartburn is related to the drought surcharge, yes. which is then gets somewhat conflated with the Prop 218 process. So there's a lot of little moving parts to these pieces. Um, But the reason why a recommendation is to really tackle this more in depth during the plan for water process, because it really has a lot to do with your policy perspective on risk and climate change and carryover storage, use of water, um, how those restrictions get implemented and layered as time goes on and drought gets worse. And so I think it warrants a deeper conversation. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for that. I think part of it also, we have storage where a lot of other districts do not. Yeah. The the primary point of a lot of the um, drought contingency plans is to have implementation of conservation measures on a more immediate level. With that said, part of the challenge we face, and we, we see this often in California, is you know you have local restrictions, and then the state layers restrictions, and then there's other restrictions, and so mm-hmm. you know not, they don't always all align. Karen, can I can I respond to you? Sure. sure. Uh, so from my perspective on the drought contingency plan, it's it's a go-to place. We can, as a board, it's our plan. We adopt it as a board to say this is the this is the guidepost. This is the direction that that we go under, and we can say this is a hybrid plan. This is where all of the information, when you click on drop contingency plan, you would go to it and you would see what the current state is. Just because it's a plan doesn't mean you just put it on the shelf and never use it again. It should be regularly used as the guidebook for, for our planning processes. And for the, for the this, uh, constituents to go to a single place and understand what is the board's policy on drop contingency plan. As of now, we could update it in six months. As new information comes in the plan for water, we can update the drought contingency plan as well, no information, and it's just a matter of that. But in my mind, plans should be living documents. They shouldn't be backwards-looking things, regulatory, just where we don't have put down, oh, by the way, our, our minimum storage is not 78 anymore, it's 100. And oh, by the way, there's surcharges now associated with every every rate Prop 218 process, we can update it. Or we can refer into the plan that refer the, the charges are as known in the rate structure, you know, the annual rate structures. But to, to just have it be a 2015 plan that, that we're not following, it, it um, from a state, per, you know, when I when I was in the business, it was like it was kind of underground regulations. It was, this is how we're operating, but this is what we're saying we're doing, but this is what we're really doing. And it's just a matter of transparency in my mind. So the policy action for the drought contingency plan was made through the adoption of the urban water management plan and the agricultural water management plan that happened in 2021 and 2020. The implementation of the specific drought stages is a is a policy consideration that's done by resolution outside of that planning effort. 
So those documents are five-year documents that we submit and are required to have and then update every five years. A very small component of the, is the drought contingency plan. So we wouldn't be in the position of updating our urban water management plan or the agricultural water management plan on an annual basis. It's just not reasonable to do that. Um, but the consideration of the stage that you're in can be done annually or more than once, depending on how the drought's going. Yeah, I thought we did a good job of following the drought contingency plan. Yeah, we're generally in compliance with it. It was regarding the raw water um, usage and the mandatory reductions is what the changes between what was included and adopted by policy in the urban water management plan, the agricultural water management plan, and the stage that was adopted by resolution. And that was in consideration because the irrigation season had already begun by the yep. time it was already implemented. Yep. As I recall, and I could be wrong, but I thought that when we were adopting at least one of the ag or urban water management plans, that there was conversation about revisiting the drought contingency plan mm -hmm. separate and apart of that plan, and that we were kind of under the time deadline to get that filed with the state and therefore didn't take time at that point for it. But my recollection is that, that was part of the conversation. And you're saying that we are going to revisit it. So right. um, I'm not, uh, I, I get Laura's point that it's an, I think particularly the, yes, the drought surcharge was a big part of the concern of constituents. Mm -hmm. But you also heard this morning at least two or three people commenting about lack of access to water, which is part of our drought contingency planning. And so um, I, I just think, it, I think it's something we don't want to lose sight of, and I think it's a fair point to make of, of trying to align our, our public-facing documents with, with what we're actually doing. So there's more moving parts to that lack of access. That's a, that's a, they're a mutual water company and there's, their pipe restricts the amount we can deliver. Okay. And they, and there's more to it. And they, they okay. couple out of those. Yeah, are you did not, yeah. And they a couple did not sign up originally. So okay. if you want to, yeah. all the water going through the conveyance is taken up. Yeah. Then it takes a neighbor to give up right and none of them wanted to yeah okay got it so it's more complex than that I do hear from people though of wanting to get into NIDs to yeah. the district yeah. service and they can't because of the drought contingency uh, phase we're in so but I get your point on those examples uh, I think the issues still exist yeah you know we want to hook up as many people as we can yeah yeah Okay, um, that was the manager's report. <laughs> that was very kind. Okay, board of directors items, reports. Would you like to go first? Sure. Um, I just wanted to uh, say thank you for, um, it, you, you made the change on the link for the plan for water, so now it's on the front page. Uh, I. I think we will continue to have people who miss it because it's blue and our site is largely blue and white, but we're doing the best we can. Um, the other thing I just would like to comment is that I, I can only imagine how much work went into redesigning that website. But I see every time I look at it, something new, something better about it. And um, I think that information is very well organized and Somebody in the organization is putting a lot of time and effort into this, and I notice it, and I appreciate it, and I think as reflected in today's comments about wanting to access our website information, that that is a really important key source for our stakeholders. So I thank whoever is doing all that good thinking and hard work. Um, and I'm, I'm doing dealing with different constituent issues, but they're all interesting and um, Great time to interact with people. Thank you, Director Hall. Director Peters. Oh, um, yeah, I, I agree. I've been looking at the website as well, and, and some things are much better, and, and, and I appreciate that. Um, 
One thing I was looking for on the website was the 2014 capacity fee study, and I couldn't find that under the district documents or anything. Is that on the website, too? We'd have to it check. It used to be. Maybe you had I think it fell off. Got lost. We can look into that. Yeah. Okay. So that was one thing I was looking for on the website that I couldn't find. And um, also, I was looking back at some documents on the the actually the Garden Bar Reservoir and how in, in October of 2011, um, South Cedar Water District came and made a, a presentation about the Garden Bar Reservoir and provided all the information and, and really was very open and transparent and gave us all kinds of information about their plan. And then I was looking at the Centennial Audit of 2018 and it said that in between 20 and 14 and 15, we entered contracts totaling 5.2 million for studies and other non-property purchase related expenditures. And then if, then looking at the plan for water, these studies and these, these the former general manager assured me that there was feasibility studies and, and looking at the past reports, there's been feasibility studies, there's been, my understanding is a water supply assessment, there's been work done that we paid $5.2 million for that I think should come to, into consideration in the plan for water because this was good information that, that we paid for and I think that we should consider it. And so that's my concern and my, my request is that we, we, as a board, we look at these contracts and see what is relevant, what is still relevant. Because the Yuba Bear the licensing did not consider the Bear River or the South Yuba River watershed. And I, my understanding is they've done a lot of work in this 5.2 million to, to assess that. But we don't know. So I'd like to have it looked at. Can I just say I would concur with that. I would like to see that the prior studies that were done as well. Um, as I was not a board member at that time, and I think it would be enriching to my knowledge base to see what analysis has already been completed for the investment the district's made. So is this a priority? So we can start digging it up, or do you, are you looking to see it in the context of the plan for water? Context. Either is fine. I mean, I assume that, I mean, I assume these, I mean, I don't know the breadth of, of what's required. No, I'd like to know the breadth of it. But, yeah, that might help be a starting point. I'm assuming that somebody has it archived in their computer. So it's just something to add to our list, right? Our list yeah. is extremely full. So if we want to include it into the plan for water, we can do that. And if we're looking to prioritize this, we can do that too, but something's going to bump off the list. Is that we're going to have to comb through all the information, come up with a spreadsheet, tell you what it is, what was, but some of it is based off of new modeling that we're going to be redoing. So I, I'm just a little. How, how relevant it is. Yeah, I, and I don't know until I start going through right. it as well. It is. And much of it's draft. That... I, and if it wasn't completed, I do have some hesitation. Were on contracts paid? That, that doesn't necessarily mean something. It's perfectly good to have a draft for preliminary review, for public review. That's a perfectly acceptable final document for us. Well, it may be a study. I'm, create, I'm making this up, but it, it may be a, a biological analysis of um, a certain species of concern uh, for the proposed project that may then build into the larger draft chapter and then draft EIR. So if you follow me, it may be a subset of a much larger analysis that is still in process that was halted um, that, uh, you know, so it's, I don't know what the documents are, but I would um, imagine that many are draft and many, um, if you just release them, they would not have the context that was uh, the purpose for which the study was undertaken. Um, so, I, we can look at it, but. I wonder if we can just get a list. Yeah. That, that, we can, but as I stated, it is creating I mean, not, additional not workload. Each one necessarily, but it's like, oh, yeah. well, we spent $5 million for these studies, and here's the list of the studies. And right. all that contracts. shouldn't be too complicated. Yeah, all those contracts. So it is from the standpoint that we have to sit and research all of it and pull all the contracts up to find out how no, much. we're not asking for you to pull the contracts. We're asking for a list, a list of contracts. A list of them and the titles of the and, Yeah, and, and how much was spent. Was. I just think that yeah. was a $5 million. So discount. the audit was completed previously and weren't the expenditures included in the audit? Yep, they were. I, in fact, I spent part of the weekend looking okay. through the old centennial audit myself. 
I just, I would caution, you know, there's a, nothing else to do. <laughs> yeah. Going back and revisiting project documents for a project that's been totally halted. Right. When in, I feel that our staff time is better spent on moving forward with the plan for water process, but I'm more than happy to, yeah, it's, it's you know, we're just going to be having, we're adding something else to the plate. And I, and the, the, the local hazard mitigation plan that we just adopted in item two, I believe, mm -hmm. it has is a very active project, um, Centennial Water Supply Project, constructed roller compacted concrete down to impound 110,000. It says um, working on environmental projects, current, currently feasibility studies and environmental studies are underway. So they bought, this is an active, this was, we just adopted it as a mitigation project that we're actively working. So that document's done by Placer County. I was not involved in it. I didn't even actually notice Centennial was included in there. I'm happy to do it. I'm just trying to express sure. that we have some significant workload issues right now. Yep. We should have a list. I mean, we should know what those contracts are. So, so you have the list of the contracts as well as an audit that was previously completed. So I, I'm, I think we're having a little bit of a disconnect, but that's okay. I don't know. I, you know, I have to go back and look at the audit and see what what those were for. I, I didn't. Anyway, I, we've, we've done all this lot. We've done, we've done a lot of background work. And my point is we should try to leverage it and see if we can, if there's anything that can inform this plan for water process. So that was my point on that one. Um, and then uh, last, last week I attended a workshop titled Collaboration, the Future of California Water Management. It was an excellent discussion hosted by CIRCLE and it was featured Dr. Kim Quinn. He's a former Metropolitan um, Deputy Director and Executive Director at Aqua. Um, and he currently is a, a fellow with the Stanford Water in the West at, at, at that program. And also Brian Graber, who is a Senior Director of River Restorations at American River. Uh, they stress the importance of transparency and collaboration in the success of all water management resource planning. Um, CIRCLE will be publishing the video soon, and I encourage all my fellow board members to take a look at the discussion on the future of, of water resource planning in California. What, and uh, Dr. Quinn has done a, a paper on He's been in the business 40 years, and, and what works in public processes and what doesn't work in it, it, it really resonated with me, and I thought it was fantastic. So thank you to Circle for putting that on. And then my next um, report is that on um, January 15th, a 38-inch long fall run Chinook salmon carcass was found in Auburn Ravine. So we do have fall run Chinook okay, in salmon. 38 inches. 38 inches. Um, it had a coated long. wire tag in its head. And it was read by California Department of Fish and Wildlife and found that it was hatched in the Nimbus fish hatchery in early 2017, wow. then transported to San Pablo Bay in June of 2018, where it was raised in nets before it was migrating, before it was sent out to migrate to the ocean. And then in the fall of 2021, it swam from the ocean through the San Francisco Bay to San Pablo Bay, through the Delta, up the Sacramento River, swam past the American River, which was his um, hatchery right, right, location. Right. But it didn't, it didn't. It took a long time. It took, a, it, it kept going 20 more miles up to wow. the lower ravines of Auburn Ravine <laughs> and then another 20 miles up to Lincoln. And well, so these. That's pretty spectacular. Yeah, yeah it's, so it's really that's very, a big fish. Yeah, like that's a big fish. That they don't always, they, they do, there's certain members of them that do go somewhere else. They don't all go back to where they were. Exactly. Right. So that proves it. That's okay. Okay. That, that is really, it was cool. a really fascinating. And so hats off to Friends of Auburn Ravine. They, they do like engaging study discussions. Uh, they do studies and, and walks with the ravine. They just do fantastic work in that region. And it just shows that it's a wonderfully opportunity stream for uh, revitalizing uh, Chinook in Northern California. Thank you. That's my report. Director Hull, uh, Director Heck. <laughs> Thank I you. I do that every time, don't I? Well, not every time. Not every time. No, you're good. Um, so I did attend the State Water Board hearing on the water rate issues on the Bear that we had. And, um, oh my gosh, there was more attorneys than I've ever seen in one room <laughs> in my life in that, in that room. Um, but that was very interesting, and I'm hoping at some point Justin, you can kind of give the board an update on where we are, or maybe that Jennifer. I appreciate it. But it was, you know, it was just a procedural thing, but it was interesting to hear it was sort of a hearing whether we're going to have a hearing. That is an item today. Oh, it is. To be yeah. discussed in close. Oh, okay. Okay, great. And, um, and then my other just quick report is I have been spending 
a great deal of time researching and reading and the, the entire rise gold water uh, issues that some of which was raised today. And it's just fascinating and I'm looking forward to learning more. That's it. Mr. Mr. Director Hedrick, Director Johansson. Yeah. Um, so there's going to be a town hall meeting uh, on climate change impacts probably first part of April. And so the, I've been invited to talk to about right. it and I'll be probably talking about food security, water. Hosting? Uh, you know, it's I, not quite sure. I was contacted by Martin Webb to participate and um, and I'll, there'll be more information coming out. Um, favorite topic of Ricky's. Um, so I talked to a general manager at length. I mean, we were on the phone a long time uh, from an irrigation district down in the valley. He has over about 30,000 acres of high intensity orchards to supply water for. And he has right now 3,600 acre feet. That's it. And he's desperately looking for water on a water transfer. That's the only way. And he has thousands of acres who want to annex into the district with the hope that they can buy transferred water. Into what district? Our district or a different district? Uh, his district is Orland Artois Water District. Oh, okay. Because you said that. Okay. But I just wanted to clarify. He could buy from any district. I just want to put out there that they're really looking for water. Having said that, pond's full. The ground is dry and starting. Antonio's starting to plant a lot of food. Amazing. Well, your pond is full. Yes. Not our pond. Ponds. Okay. Thank you, Director Jansen. The only uh, comment I have is that a constituent uh, asking if they're on the email list, do we for the uh, plan for water meetings? He said he wasn't getting notices on the email list. He's probably going to his spam folder. That's a good point. Yeah. Because yeah. I go, this stuff is all, I'm yeah. assuming the dates and times. He said, I saw the minutes, I saw the meeting happen, but I didn't see the, the notice. And I go, okay. And otherwise, there's this growing interest in that. that I'm encouraged about that. Right. Yeah. Okay. Director Johansson mentioned that sparked my. Oh, go ahead. Speaking of, of, of transfers, I know that this is an item on the closed session agenda that could discuss a transfer. And I was looking at the um, government code. It's really the Brown Act. Um, it says that you know we can we can hold closed sessions with negotiators prior to purchase, sale, exchange, or lease of real property. This is the code section that was cited for this transfer discussion. And um, in, in my division, what I've always heard is that there's, there's been a, it's, I couldn't find it in policy, I couldn't find direction from the board on our position on transfers. But um, the uh, Government Code 54956.8 notes that prior to the closed session, the legislative body of the local agency shall hold an open and public session in which it identifies the negotiators, the real properties to be negotiated, who of concern, and the person or persons with whom we're negotiating. And that says in an open and public session. And this is our second um, closed session item on this topic. And I've had people ask me, well, what's it about? Why? I mean, we've historically been both transfer. We're in a drought right now. We're paying extra money for our water. We, we can't have our customers hook up. Why are you entertaining transfers? I don't think we've been opposed to transfers. Okay. I don't know. Did, you, do you know where it's right now? Transfer water to some place. Transfer water. within the watershed. Well, it's still a transfer. No, we're not. We're not officially opposed to transfers. But we don't have policy. We don't have direction on our our what our thoughts are on transfers. And so I would just caution us as a board that to be cognizant of this. That this is kind of a, something that I believe should be discussed in open session to, to hear from our constituents what is the what is the board's position on transfers in general. 
before we start real property negotiation. So thank you for reminding me of that. Well, I, I agree, Laura, that somehow we have to do whatever it is that we've got to do in closed session that is appropriate. But I, too, have gotten questions about, well, we're seeing this on your agenda. What does this mean? Are you going to do selling water? And what are you going to uh? And it seems like it is appropriate to have an open, transparent discussion amongst the board members about what our position is, what, what it would take for us to do it if we wanted to do it. You know, just have a, a wide-ranging discussion about it. And it, we wouldn't have to talk about costs or right. those things, no. but, but the, the policy about whether we go forward or not seems like it is appropriate for a, a public discussion. Yeah. yeah. Agreed. Agreed. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. With that, we'll um, take take public comment uh, items to be considered in the closed session, and then we'll take a break. Anybody like to comment on items to be considered in the closed session? Start on your phone. Okay. Uh, Kiko Mertz. Ed. Hi, everyone. Right? Can you hear me? Yes. It, it's Keiko. Thank you for asking. Go like ahead. birthday cake. Um, all right. Uh, well, good morning, everyone. This is Keiko Mertz speaking on behalf of South Huber River Citizens League, also known as Circle. Um, thanks for the opportunity to provide comments on the items that are being considered in today's closed session. I'd like to focus my thoughts on item B in the closed session. Um, Circle and our colleagues are concerned to see this item on the agenda, and we're hoping that before entering closed session, the district might shed some light on this item. It appears that NID is proposing to transfer water south of the Delta in 2022. And although water year 2022 has had a great start, conditions, uh, drought conditions could still persist. Um, we hope the district has both prudently and respectfully analyzed exporting water against its customers in their service area, especially under continued dry conditions. Circle fears this activity could be an indicator of future endeavors by the district, which to us would call into question the motive for pursuing a new dam and unfortunately cast a shadow on the transparency of the plan for water process. Additionally, the legality of deciding on a water sale, which could constitute real property without a public hearing is unclear. Circle also believes that such an action, regardless of legality, could greatly damage the community's trust and rapport with the district. So we, po we posed the following question this morning. First, uh, we're wondering why this hasn't yet been disclosed to the public. And second, can the district explain the rationale for such a water sale? We hope you can understand the alarm this has raised among our coalition, and we hope the district continues its current efforts toward transparency and relationship building. And we truly appreciate the opportunity to share our thoughts on this agenda item today. Um, thank you guys so much for your time this morning. Thank you, Keiko. Uh, Tracy Sheehan, you're next. Hey, Tracy, can you hear us? Can't hear you. You muted yourself, Tracy. Did you want to speak, Tracy? You need to unmute your phone. Turn on your phone. Okay. All right, anybody else like to comment? Items to be considered in the closed session. Turn on your phone. Okay. All right. Then we will close. So after the recess, the Zoom will close. Zoom will close after the recess. Okay, this time we'll take a five minute recess. We're going to close this right now. <laughs> so,